On the surface, Douglas Murray's recent bestseller, The Strange Death of Europe, was a reaction to the migrant crisis of 2015, where he spent months at Europe's borders, interviewing migrants, natives, and policymakers. But in it, he argues that the migrant crisis and Europeans' reaction to it is another symptom of a broader spiritual crisis, a crisis of meaning, and a sense that the story has run out at a fundamental level. So in A Strange Death of Europe you say, how long can a society survive once it unmoored itself from its founding source and drive? Yes. Which is quite reminiscent, like Jordan Peterson has soared to public consciousness over the last couple of years with a very, very similar message. Right. Do you think this is something that a lot of people are now waking up to? Uh, I wouldn't say waking up to it, th I think um, they're intuiting it, I think have been for a long time. And as I said, it, it takes a little bit of time to be willing to sort of voice it, because it's, as I said, not just you may be wrong, and it's embarrassing to be wrong on such a big thing, but it's not so much that as, well, what are you going to do about it? Um, I try to just diagnose where I think we are. Uh, I'm not particularly prescriptive of what I think happens now. I've got various instincts about it, but um, I think that that unmooring, unmooredness is, yeah, I'm not, obviously I'm not the only person to have pointed it out. Uh, there are problems about pointing it out because uh, a lot of people don't want to accept the premise that I'm saying there, that, we, that we've divorced ourselves from the ways in which we've got where we have, because they think it's a way to open up the door for religion to come back in, or for unpleasant forms of religion to come back in, or very prescriptive forms of religion to come back in, or they think you might be doing something else. Um, there are all sorts of motives you could ascribe to anyone pointing this out something you're, you're up to secretly behind the scenes. And I think those are just among some of the reasons why people are wary about allowing that conversation to begin. Because where will it take us? And I mean, to that one, my own answer is, I don't know. I think it's probably worth, it's probably worth risking it with our eyes as wide open as possible, rather than pretending it away. But yes, there are other people who've, who've noticed similar things. Doubtless others you could name. From Nietzsche onwards? Yeah. I mean, Nietzsche foresaw a lot of this, um, as did various others. I mean, occasionally I get... Um, it happened recently in, in a BBC interview about Oswald Spengler, the centenary of uh, publication of his great masterwork. And an interviewer said, well, you know, Spengler said some of what you're saying 100 years ago. And I said, well, you know, there's, there's no inevitability to the idea that civilizations become unmoored and then die or crash within, say, a four- or five-year parliamentary term. Um, you know, these things may take a lot of time. And the second thing is that, as it were, the most positive interpretation of of what I'm saying and the most positive interpretation of the fact that s some other people have said some of it before, the most po positive interpretation you could take from that would be to say, well, maybe it's the case that we're often having bad diagnoses like this, as it were, um, almost terminal diagnoses, and yet we survive and therefore maybe and this is, this is as it were, the most positive point that you could make against what I'm saying, maybe, in that case, um, premature or possibly premature um, diagnoses of our own mortality as civilizations may be something that keeps us healthy. Um, could be. It's not such a bad um, thing to bear in mind. But, I mean, that's, that's the best-case scenario, of course. In the debates with... Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson, you said we may be in the midst of discovering that the only thing worse than religion is its absence. Yes. Is this a little bit, um, I'm reminded of G.K. Chesterton's idea that if a man stops believing in God, he starts believing in anything. Mm. Is what you're saying there that we, we have the capacity for very fundamentalist 
ways of looking at the world and we will attach them to anything. Part of what we're going through at the moment is the discovery that we don't have very much to hold on to. And by that I mean, among other things, that we can no longer even agree on facts, it seems. Um, this is worse in some countries than others. I'd have thought that at this stage in its development, America has this worst. But um, as the Irish journalist Kevin Myers said a few years ago, sort of something I'm fond of quoting, uh, he said in his memoir, Watching the Door, he described a moment where he said, the truth had become whatever you were having yourself. Now, we are, we are reaching a similar stage, it seems to me. Certainly, America is already at that stage. You can, you can see it everywhere. Nobody can agree on what's true. Nobody can even agree on what's happened. Um, not just historically, where everyone has now got their own view of history regarding their own political side, but also what's happened literally today. Even today's facts are disputed, and it's not as if they ever reach a conclusion now. They just, they just go off in different directions. And, uh, and I think that that is a, a version of what I'm... That's a part of what I'm trying to say when I say that, that we may be discovering that the only thing worse than religion is its absence, is that the um, people seem to be finding it extremely hard. And I don't absolve myself from this, by the way. I'm not saying that I sit in some unique position where I don't suffer from this. I think we all do to some extent. But I think people are finding it very hard to know what it is you do hold on to, what you can hold on to, what are, to put it another way, fixed certainties. Now, religion, in, among many other things, provides people, erroneously we may think, but with fixed certainties. For instance, uh, the biggest of which is some kind of cosmic idea of justice. And a, a watered-down version of which we imbibe in our societies today. What is it that the rug on the floor of the Oval Office said, but the uh, arc of human history is long, but it tends towards justice? Um, there's not a lot of evidence for that rug being true, but it's a wonderful idea and probably hard to live entirely without. Uh, religion provides, among other things, that idea. It gives you the idea that if not now, then in a future world, you will see justice. And it's a wonderful idea. And there are many smaller concepts which religion probably alone can provide, which without it, people struggle. Um, one obvious example being one that obsesses me is how do, you, how do you actually believe, not just get told to follow through on, or at least, but how do you actually believe in the, in the concept of the sanctity of human life? I'm not trying to get on, onto abortion or anything on this, but th how do you believe in the sanctity of human life as we live it in the absence of religion? Well, we have a version of it in human rights, which is a sort of, um, a, a non-religious attempt to enshrine a religious idea. But it's filled with trouble. And there's, as I say, there in that concept is a very, very deep and important thing to hold on to. God knows we need to hold on to it. But you can see how even that slips. It slips at the, at the margins. It slips at the edges. And, and in the absence of that, if we are, as I think we obviously are, meaning-seeking beings, whether or not there is meaning, and I think the second bit I'll park for the time being, but if we are indeed meaning-seeking beings, then we will keep coming up with religions. And I think that's what's happening at the moment, broadly speaking, in the cultures, that the, our, our news is filled with religious urges and religious stories and a, um, a newly emerging priesthood with a newly emerging set of commandments and a newly emerging set of blasphemies and heresies and punishments and shamings and floggings and... All uh, on social media? Some on social media and some in the real world. I mean, I'm always struck by the way in which, by the number of people who say to me, well, things that you 
are able to say and think about and write about and so on, if I said it in my job, I'd probably lose it. Uh, and and, and that's, that's one of the... And of course, we can all name people who that has happened with. Um, that's one of the things, isn't it? It means that almost anything, anything can be pushed. Uh, um, it's, it's, very, it's, very, it's an obvious, perhaps it's too much of a cliche to, to say, but it, it, it's in, very short, in a very short period of time, it's become really quite hard to tell what's satire and what's real in our world. Um, they keep on getting clogged up or mixed up together. You notice they seem to dance together. And um, sometimes it's revealed that the satire is real and sometimes it emerges that the real is satire. And um, I think this leads to an enormous discombobulation. And yes, there is a very clear, as I see it, religious impulse throbbing through our society today, creating a new religion. By the way, I just preferred the old ones. <laughs> I don't believe in them, but I preferred the old ones all, all in all. Not least because I think you knew where you stood, and we just no damn idea where you stand with this one. I mean, who knew that if you were a woman who said that you thought that being a woman involved having a vagina, that you'd be some kind of absolutely despicable heretic in 2018, who knew, who knew that if you were a woman on the Labour left who campaigned for all women's shortlists, which is not particularly something I'm in favour of, but who'd have, who'd have predicted that if you're a woman in, in favour of all women's shortlists and you've been campaigning for ages for them, that in 2018, if you said, look, that, that, that girl with a penis can't be on the all women's shortlist, that you'd become some disgusting, unmentionable bigot. Uh, we wouldn't have seen that coming even two years ago, probably. And is that the main religion that you're, that you're seeing It's one growing? of them. It's one of them. But it could be absolutely... I mean, I sort of point to it because it could be anything. I mean, Saul Bellow said um, in the uh, early 80s, he said that... He said already that America was getting to the position that... Uh, um, Morality in America, he said, I think you can say this wider than morality now, but he said morality in America had become a ghost town. The problem with ghost towns is that almost anybody can come in and declare themselves sheriff. Um, who would you rely upon now to tell you something was true or not? It's who would you nominate? Who, if you nominated them, would you feel you could get the agreement of everyone else in society to nominate? It's, it's getting hard, I think. These, uh, lots of these points, sort of the, the difficulty in making sense of the world, who do you trust, this whole idea of heresies um, links into the, the concept of the intellectual dark web. In, in some sense, if there is something that links many of the figures together, it's that they have been heretics to their own tribe. Sure. You, you sort of take Sam Harris and the Ben Affleck or Brett Weinstein being kind of run out of Evergreen. What, what do you make of the IDW? I think it's, it's a very smart concept to try to corral a very difficult group of very disparate people into one um, orbit. I think Jordan Peterson called it a herd of cats when I asked him about it. <laughs> yes, that's, that's, that's possible. Um, I, I think that there is some resistance to it within its own um, um, proclaimed membership. I, uh, I think relatively few people say I'm, you know, I'm, I'm IDW or something. I mean, I don't, I don't specially think of myself in this regard because I... I suppose I never particularly think of clubs of which I'm a member, or parties or movements or anything like that. So maybe it would, maybe it would be a movement for people who don't join movements. I don't know. Club for people who don't like clubs. Um, I, th I think so. I think it's 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 got all sorts of um, inbuilt awkwardness. But I think it's also on uh, Eric Weinstein when he came up with it. I think he's definitely onto something. Um, it's something like, I've tried to think about it, and 
I think it's something like people who have trodden on one of the IEDs of our time and have survived. Um, now, there's a very interesting question as to why some people um, set off one of the societal bombs waiting to catch people out and everything is over and done with and others seem to be able to do it and survive. But it's got something to do with being outside of the normal gatekeeping organisations, I think. Something like that. But the real underlying thing is this, I think, which is that it is preposterous that almost everything that is true is so hard to say in public and so controversial to say in public and so disputed and so, so howled against. Um, I think everybody who's been described as a member of the, the IDW probably has, among other things, one thing in common, which is they all are used to being howled at for saying things that are self-evident, howled at in public, only to then discover that the public come up to them in private and say, thank you so much for saying what we think. Um, and of course, that's one of the beauties of it. That's one of the beauties of technology at the moment is that the gatekeepers, having just said that all the problems of not being able to appoint gatekeepers anymore, but that there's a whole set of things where the gatekeepers have sort of let everybody down, I think. And I suppose, I'm not saying that I or anyone else can do it, uh, either individually or collectively, but it, it seems to devolve onto individuals to say and think about things that are of wider relevance than a lot of the gatekeepers think are questions we should be engaging in. Um, I was very struck, somebody came up to me after the event in London with Sam and Jordan and said, um, they, uh, they had a copy of that day's New York Times and like page one, two and three I think were about something to do with trans. And this person said, this is why people are here. I said, I'm not sure they're here because of the New York Times running so much about trans and we didn't address any, anything to do with that tonight. But I, I got what he meant. It was like, we're being given really weird, quite fringe stuff all the time as our diet and we're starting to rebel. And in the, the Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson debate, would you say that you were, I mean, you've talked about your concerns of what happens if we lose religion or, or religious faith. Would you say you're closer to Jordan or to Sam on that point? It sounds like you're closer to Jordan. I'm slightly equidistant. I, um, I don't have Sam's belief. I don't have, let me put it another way, I don't have Sam's faith in the idea that if we just brush away the remaining bracken from religion, left by religion, that we get to this reasonable, rational world. Um, and I, I wish him obviously well, not just as a friend, but I wish him well in pursuing that idea and winning. But um, there's an awful lot of historical examples of people trying something relatively similar and then discovering that they're right back at square one. Um, when Danton and Robespierre are standing outside uh, uh, Notre Dame in Paris after the revolution and they work out that they can make this a cathedral of reason. You know, I mean, like, there's a lot, of, there's a lot there's a lot about the pursuit of reason and rationalism that suggests that we're not great at it, actually, individually or collectively. 
or to put it another way, that we can keep on doing just terrible things and sometimes newly terrible things. So that's an obvious prejudice, as it were, of my own. And yet I think that what Jordan is saying or doing with religion, which I think is extraordinary and um, admirable and apart from anything else, quite extraordinary, quite amazingly multi-disciplinary. Um, I mean, that's one of the amazing things about what he's been able to do and what was a pleasure about listening to him and watching him in those debates. Um, he was one evening, I think, in Dublin, he just tried to only approach things from using biology. You know, and it's, it's an amazing, an amazing uh, sight and achievement. But I, I'm not sure where that's going. I'm, and I'm sympathetic with Sam when he tries to pin Jordan down and Jordan gets out of the pinning down. I'm sympathetic to both of them in that. My own, um, my own position on it, I suppose, is that I'm pretty willing to answer the questions that Sam would pose on, I don't know, Jordan, for instance, would find it doesn't want to, won't, well, no, let me be. If you asked Jordan, do you believe in the physical resurrection? He would not say yes or no. He would do a brilliant um, extrapolation of a lot of thoughts. And maybe that is right. Maybe you shouldn't be able to just yes or no. I think in my own case, I can say I'm, I'm pretty confident it didn't happen. But I'm confident to say that it didn't, pr pretty much confident to say it didn't happen. And also say that doesn't mean that I'm going to follow Sam Harris into a world of pure reason and rationalism because I don't think it's much more achievable. I think I've myself arrived at the position of believing you have to be careful on warring on things which have given you something of worth. Um, and I respect Jordan's um, enormous ability and passion in trying to re-inject that particular part of worth back into the substructure of the society, which I think is one of the things he's managing to do. Um, do you have any sense? I mean, you're sort of saying that we can't do without religion in some sense, or we can't, and we can't sort of reinvent our own values. We've, we've, we've shown many times that we can't reinvent our own values. Do you have any sort of sense of how we kind of resolve that? Is it a new religion? Is it a new kind of... Historically, it's um, the invention of a new religion or war. Um, it's a pretty good time if you wanted to start a religion. Now would be a great time. Thought must have crossed your mind. Um, if you were to claim, since no one's done it very plausibly for a while, but if you were to claim that, that you had yourself dipped the bucket right down into the well and brought up a, th a bucket full of the real thing, you could do quite well these days. I think it's one of the... I, th I sensed in the debates with Sam and Jordan, I sensed that it was one of the things that was constantly hovering. I don't know if you agree, but constantly hovering over the events. Jordan in London gave a very moving and spellbinding description of a uh, conversation. Um, the sort of prophet nature of the two of them, you mean? Yes. Specifically focusing on Jordan, I think. I think that Sam's followers uh, and admirers um, I think aren't, aren't expecting any kind of breakout beyond what he's said. I, I, I mean, there's lots more for Sam to cover and talk about, but I don't think there's anything they don't think they've... I don't think they think there's anything that hasn't yet happened, in a way. And I thought that when Jordan started describing in London a conversation with a figure of what he saw as God the Father, 
you could sense in the audience a feeling of, is something going to happen now? It was a spellbinding moment. Um, but, but there's something... I, I, it just goes back to the point I was trying to make, was, is that a, 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 a plausible attempt to reassert a set of very basic truths and claims that religions have always made, we're very ripe for that at the moment. And my own view is that we're quite lucky that some total charlatan and shit hasn't come along with enormous power already to do that. Um, maybe it's less possible in the modern information age than it would have been even in the time of the founder of Mormonism, but let alone in what used to be called the age of the prophets. But it's always there, isn't it? And, and, and if you have things like massive societal upheaval or war or catastrophic events, we're all totally available, aren't we? It's terrifying. Returning to the IDW, it's, it's been framed as an alternative sense-making network. Mm. And in that sense... That, that's where you, you, I hear the, that said in the accent of the Weinstein brothers. Yeah. Um, your, it's very, and a lot of the people within it, Joe Rogan, Dave Rubin, have, have created, Sam Harris as well, have created new media platforms distinct from the mainstream media as an alternative <coughs> to the mainstream media. Um, you're grouped within this organisation, or this loose grouping, but you're the associate editor of The Spectator magazine. Yeah. Um, what does it say about the different media landscapes? Well, the, I think a lot of us have a foot in and a foot out. Um, I, I mean, I, th I don't think any of us are, as it were, complete outsiders, and I don't think anyone has ever pretended they were. Um, Jordan has spent his life with positions at some of the top universities in the world, and um, Eric is a head of Teal Capital, and uh, um, I've not been uh, exactly silenced during my career, or at least not successfully, and uh, have a large number of publications and medium, mediums o open to me, and I'm very grateful and lucky. But, so I think that it doesn't, it, it's wrong to think of it as being an insider-outsider thing or, a, um, or an establishment, anti-establishment thing or something like that. Um, I'm not certain that there's a massive difference between America and Europe or America and the UK in in terms of this. I know that in, in Europe and the UK, the culture wars are fought slightly differently than they are in America because the, the area of contestation is different and the width of the contestation is different. And after all, there's a lot of stuff that we've sort of pretty much for good and for ill agreed upon in Europe that is not agreed upon in America. Um, so I'm not, I'm not certain there is any kind of transatlantic divide. What are you thinking of? If, if what we're seeing in the US at the moment is that the center cannot hold, there is a kind of increasing polarization and a lack of agreement as to what even the facts consist of. Right. In some sense in the UK, we have, a bit, we have the BBC, we have some sense of a civic space that is not um, completely polarised. Although, isn't it the case, everyone says so at the moment, that the BBC is coming in for endless attack and is actually feeling the attack, and I think it probably is, from the left and from the right at the moment. There's this, without wanting to get a bore on British politics at the moment, I mean, the anti-Brexit people think the BBC is pro-Brexit, the pro-Brexit people think the BBC is anti-Brexit, the Corbynistas think that the BBC is institutionally anti-Corbyn, and uh, Conservatives seem to think that the BBC is giving Corbyn a great big leg over the wall of number 10 Downing Street. So, so it's uniting people. Well, there's a fallacy there which, which, which a lot of people at the BBC and others fall for, which is 
must be doing something right since I'm getting criticised from both sides. And it's a fallacy, obviously, because you can be criticised by absolutely everyone. That's because you're totally wrong. <laughs> it doesn't. There's a, there's a weird, by the way, can I point this out? There's a weird thing of what I think of as being equidistance-ism. It's an ugly ism. But where people think if they oppose something there, they don't quite know how they hold the ground they feel they're in. And so what they do is they get something there to the other side and they say, well, see, I'm standing between these two things. I'm, I'm very, very wary about this tactic because I've seen it used, among other things, against many of my friends and against me for many years. I remember more than a decade ago, somebody writing from, as it happens, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in The Guardian, claiming that Ayan Hersiali and Martin Amis and me were merely the flip side of the coin of Osama bin Laden. And um, you'll notice what he did there. And um, notice that neither I nor Ayan nor Martin have flown planes into buildings or told anyone else to do so. And Not been caught, anyway. Not been caught, no. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's so it, once you've seen it done to somebody or had it done to you, that kind of other side of the coinism becomes a very cheap trick. Cheap trick. I, I pretty much resist it myself. You see it everywhere. Uh, uh, okay, we found somebody who we can accuse of that from the left. Let's find somebody from the right we can accuse it of, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a sort of, but it's it's the sort of game that people start to play when they feel there's nowhere else to hold on to on the water slide. You know, let me get something from both sides to hold myself something like steady. Um, so I'm not entirely persuaded that the media landscape is the defining di or the distinct difference, but it, it, it probably is the case in Britain. There's, a, there's, there's less of the complete talking past each other than has emerged now in the US. Um, it's possible. There is some agreement still about reality in the UK. Do you have any sense, are you very pessimistic about this kind of increasing polarisation or do you have any sense of how we pull out of this spiral? I'm, um, well, I mean, there's cause for optimism and pessimism, isn't there, as there is in, in everything. Um, I'm pessimistic in the fact that I think that people are becoming so incredibly embedded and irrational in their embeddedness. And... I mean, I'm just able to say it seems to me absolutely anything now. I'm very, I'm very pessimistic about that. I think I'm pessimistic about what I describe as a tendency to talk about each other and not to each other. I spent part of my summer touring Australia and New Zealand with Dr. Cornell West. Um, the point of the engagements, for me at any rate, being that, and I think for Cornell as well, being to demonstrate that people from totally different political um, traditions um, could sit on stage for hours at a time, night after night, talking about important things, not, not dodging things, not ducking, but um, being able to have a, a rich and meaningful dialogue and sorting some things out, you know, which I think we did actually, uh, between ourselves, if not for anyone else. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm very struck by how few people do that. And there's, obvious, there's lots of reasons for why that's happened. We all know, and, and I'm afraid that the mainstream media has been a massive component of that strange, degrading uh, um, tendency. But the thing that you can be optimistic about in it is that it's obvious that new things are coming through. I mean, and, th and this, is, this is always the, the way, isn't it? I mean... You can, you can berate and bewail, as I do, the YouTubization of discussion that means that the BBC or ITV or let alone um, some of the American networks will get on one absolutely shouty, crazy nutter from one direction, then one absolutely shouty, crazy nutter from another and call that a discussion. And that... I believe, embeds itself with a new generation of people who think that is discussion. 
you can bewail and bemoan that, but look, what we're doing now is a demonstration of the opposite, which is it turns out, yes, that can happen, and it also turns out that there's a reaction to that, which means that there's an audience for long-form, often multi-hour discussions. I mean, this... So, so there's always... There's always both uh, reason for optimism and pessimism in this. I, the thing I'm most nervous about is, is that we, need, we do need to find some way to agree on certain tent pegs. Um, certain lines, it's, it's, just, it's just very difficult as you're going through it. Douglas Murray, thank you very much. Thank you.